let's take a look at the kettlebell swing. And unlike most of our demo videos that are, that are a minute or two minutes long, this is actually going to be a longer intro to the kettlebell swing, and there's a couple of main reasons for that. First one is, this is an exercise that is ballistic, it is fast. We perform it at speed, which means that we actually have a higher rate of error. And if we're doing a whole lot of kettlebell swings, which often we do in a workout, then the risk of error compounding to yield an injury goes way up. Um, the second thing is that I've learned, learned how to do kettlebell swings several times in my life. I was first introduced to kettlebell swings in a CrossFit class, uh, and then there was someone who came in to our CrossFit class who was like a kettlebell guy, who like taught us some new stuff about kettlebells and really gave us some coaching. And then a few years ago, I found Strong First and started relearning how to do kettlebell swings. And when I learned to do kettlebell swings well, a couple things happened. One was my back stopped hurting after doing kettlebell swings. Something makes your back hurt, it's probably not awesome. And the second thing was that through high rep kettlebell swing and doing a lot of kettlebell swings over the course of a couple of years, I actually put, uh, improved my deadlift by about 20% having not deadlifted for easily 12 months. And so what I've learned and what I figured out working with a lot of athletes is that if we can learn to do a kettlebell swing right, we're learning to be explosive. We're engaging the hamstrings, we're engaging the glutes. It lets us do lower body strength work without a ton of sheer force on the knees, which if we've got knees that have been around for a long time or don't feel very good, sheer forces are problematic. Kettlebell swings generally work pretty darn well. But again, it's important that we learn to do these things right. That's why this is going to be a longer intro to the kettlebell swings. It'll be worth it. Hang out with it because um, we're going to get into this and we're going to go through a very standard, very high quality progression. Two last things. One, if you want to learn more about kettlebell swings, I'd highly encourage you to start with the Strong First library, Pavel's books, Pavel's video. Uh, I firmly believe that this is the best stuff that's on the market. Other people repackage and reteach what, what Pavel teaches. I still think, though, that his is the best. Um, it's the most consistent. The other thing I'll tell you about kettlebell swings is that this is the gateway to lots of other skills. Kettlebell swing, a two-handed swing that we work on today is the beginning of a one-handed swing. Once we do a one-handed swing, we can do a kettlebell clean to the rack, and we can do a snatch to overhead. We can get into a lot of other positions, a lot of other exercises, just having mastered this one thing. Lastly, when it comes to load, for most people who are getting started with kettlebell swings, for women, or for folks who are a little smaller, a little bit weaker, um, not trying to be gendered here, but just overall biases or overall kind of guidelines. Typically starting about a 12 kilo kettlebell, which is about 25 pounds. And for men, people who've been training for a while, a 35 pound or a 16 kilo kettlebell tends to be a pretty good size. Now, again, I'm not trying to offend anybody with those, just try to give some rough estimates. The reason for that though, is that we generally need to stay a little bit lighter with a kettlebell swing so that we can learn to do it well. Years ago, I had my wife swinging a 12 kilo kettlebell and her back kept hurting and she kept bugging me like, hey, you need to order an eight kilo. You need to get me something smaller, something lighter so I can practice with. And the problem wasn't that the kettlebell was too heavy. The problem was that her technique wasn't good. And in fact, going lighter would have meant that she was less aware of the technique. So for a lot, a lot of us, and again, this is a little bit biased, a little bit, towards, a little bit gender, um, but there are plenty of people, sometimes women, we need to go heavier than we think they should. That was my wife's story. And then there's plenty of us also who need to go a little bit lighter than they think we, than we think we should. This is typically men. This was definitely my story. I was like, I'm going to go swing in a 24 kilo. And really what I needed to do, to do was groove my technique out of 16. So a couple thoughts there about load. With that, uh, let's get started in this progression. Learn how to do a kettlebell swing. In the mission to work and to learn the kettlebell swing, the place we're going to start is with a kettlebell deadlift. And whenever we talk about a deadlift, really all we, we mean is we're taking the load from the ground to full standing with that load hanging below the hips. So I've got Susan set up here, and I'm going to have her do a couple reps facing sideways so that we can see her back position and her hip position. And then I'll have her do a few with her facing you guys so you can see her foot position. But I'll tell you right now, her feet are just outside the hip width, and they are parallel her big toes or her second toes even are pointing forward inside of her shoes. The kettlebell is between her big toes or between the balls of the feet. 
We don't want it to be out in front because that's going to put more leverage into the spine, a longer moment arm, which is going to give us more risk of injury. We also don't want it to be really far back, at least not to start. We can always progress that. So kettlebell's positioned, Susan pushes her butt back, grabs a kettlebell, and she's going to do two things. First, she's going to make sure that her back is really strong. Now, this is only 25 pounds. She doesn't need to generate as much strength as she's, she's really strong back here. I know that from training with her. So she doesn't need to use all of it, but it needs to be turned on. The second thing to note, her butt has shot way back, and that's exactly what we want to see. We don't want to have a ton of knee bend here. You know, if you ever drop your butt several inches, this is really becoming more of a squat, right? There's a lot more knee flexion here. Susan could even pull her hips down even further, make this real squatty. This is not our ideal position. Go ahead and push your hips back up, so we're going to hinge. This is our hinge position, right? You could imagine that her thighs and her pelvis have come really close together. She's closed that angle. That's what we mean by a hinge. Last point about her position right now. Her weight is evenly balanced between the balls and the heels, which is exactly where we want it to be. She'll take a little breath. She'll hold her abdomen tight. She's going to push through her heels, squeeze her butt, stand on up. And then, butt back, come on down. And Susan, do two more for me. So we see that there's no change in the shape of her spine. She's wearing a sweatshirt. It's a cold, rainy day in Salt Lake City. Totally fine. But there's no bending. There's no flexing. There's no extending. We go ahead and rotate 90 degrees so we're facing the camera. So again, feet are hip width and parallel, or even just a little wider than hip width. Each of us is going to find the, the, the foot position with wives that works for us, and you might even need to turn the toes in a couple of degrees or turn them out a few degrees, kind of depending on how things feel. But I'll have Susan set up in the same position, but is back. You'll notice that her eyes are straight out in front. She's almost looking at the base of the tripod of the camera, so she's looking forward at the floor eight, maybe ten feet out, squeeze her glutes, she's going to stand on up, butt back, kettlebell comes on down. Great, let's do two more, and I want you guys to notice also that she is putting the kettlebell back in the same spot on the ground every single time. That's great, that tells us that we've got good discipline of movement, and every rep looks just like the one before. If you are newer to kettlebell swings, or if, if you've never even gone back and practiced just the deadlift, I highly encourage that you do that. This really is the place to start. It only takes 10 or 20 reps to groove the pattern of the hip hinge. But if we don't do that, go slow with the deadlift, when we try to go fast and lift it with the kettlebell swing, stuff's probably going to fall apart. So start with the deadlift, and then we'll come back in just a second and we'll get into the first progression, which is honestly just the setup for a kettlebell swing. Be right back. Now, we're going to start working towards the kettlebell swing. The, the big difference from my experience between the way that I was taught, quote unquote taught, to do a kettlebell swing in a CrossFit gym in DC versus what I got when I first went to a strong first seminar was that a kettlebell swing in my CrossFit class started here, right? We'd pick the kettlebell up and we'd get the hips into a swaying movement to get a little bit of swing into it. When I went to a, when I went to a strong first seminar, I learned something totally new which was thinking of the kettlebell swing like a pendulum movement. Think about one of those, I think, it's an, I think it's Einstein's cradle, this like 1980s piece of desk kitsch, a whole bunch of steel balls on strings, and you pick one up and you let it fall back in, and they all go back and forth. We're just even starting a grandfather clock swinging. You don't start a pendulum by picking it up, you start a pendulum by pulling it back. So we need to set up our bodies relative to the kettlebell so that we can get that pendulum started get that swing started with that pendulum motion. So here's what we're going to do. Susan's going to measure one foot distance from her kettlebell, so she's got her toes against the kettlebell. Second foot comes behind, she'll move the first foot in line, and then she's going to step her feet hip width or just a little wider again. Really the same position as she was from the deadlift, except now that kettlebell is one shoe distance out in front. Now, if you have really, really huge feet and really short arms, this is probably going to be the wrong position. If you have really, really tiny arms and like huge long legs, you're going to need to change your position too. But this is a good starting point. And again, we're going to play with this rule. Every single thing that we do with the kettlebell, from here on out with the swing, it should always be going back to that same spot. I should be able to put a quarter on the floor right underneath the kettlebell, and Susan come back to that quarter every single time. So that's our foot position, that's our kettlebell position relative to the feet. Now I'm going to have Susan set up. It's going to look a lot like her deadlift setup. Butt goes back. Hands on the kettlebell, 
She's gonna pull her shoulders back, and did you see what just happened? Go ahead and release the kettlebell for me for a second. Okay, watch this. I'm gonna instruct Susan to pack her shoulders, which means pull these guys away from her ears, and look what happens with the kettlebell. It didn't move on the ground, it just got pulled towards her. So if we were to think about drawing a line from the side of her shoulder, through her arm, through the kettlebell handle into the floor, that is all of one straight line. That is exactly the setup that we want. Susan, go ahead and let, let go of the kettlebell, stand on up. We should be able to come back to this position instantaneously without a whole lot of thought or a whole lot of effort. Let's try this, come straight back into it. Great, and I know you guys watched the deadlift piece, so let's talk about a couple things again. Long back, straight spine, there's no extensive, ex there's no, uh, there's not excessive extension, she's not pulling her chest back, there she's not flexed forward. This is a really long body position for her, and because her hips are so far behind her feet, when she's ready to do a kettlebell swing in a couple of minutes, it is gonna be hips, glutes, hamstrings that are driving that swing for the most part, which is exactly what we want. Guys, if you stay here longer than 30 seconds, your hamstrings should start to talk to you. If not, they're not loaded adequately, and that's not right. We need a loaded when we get into our setup. Anyways, that is our kettlebell swing setup. We're gonna take a second, and we're gonna come back, and then we're gonna talk about how we get into the very first movement of the swing, which is our hike pass or our hike pull. Be right back. When I say that learning the kettlebell swing is a multi-step process and that this progression really matters, I truly mean it. Susan is going to do the first movement of the kettlebell here, but this isn't even a swing yet, but it is the first half of the swing. And because the swing is ballistic, which means it goes fast, if we are wrong at the beginning, it never gets more right. It only gets worse from there. So the setup, and then this first piece, this ball pull, or the hike swing, or the hike pull, this is really important. So here's what's going to happen. Susan's going to set herself up again. She'll measure out with that foot. At some point, she'll be so experienced with this, she doesn't need to do it anymore. Honestly, I still I started learning that, trying to learn that trick five years ago. I still do it most swings. Push your hips back, come on down. Now let's just do a quick check in, right? Shoulders are packed and engaged. I can see the width right underneath her armpits and underneath her sports bra. Hips are back, which means she's loaded in the hamstrings. If I were like to tap her hamstring, pretty sure we feel fairly stiff right now. It's got some tension into it. But here's what's gonna happen. Susan is gonna pull the kettlebell between her legs, pull it up and back like she's like hiking a football to another player, but she's not gonna have a ton of movement through her hips and shoulders. There's gonna be a little bit. But I want you to notice how little it is. Susan, let's do five of those. So why is Susan moving at all? Go ahead and stand on up. The only reason she was moving through those five poles was because she had 25 pounds that was trying to pull her around and she needed to move in opposition to it. So rather than her trying to like force herself to stay static, or letting the kettlebell move her around, her body was actually moving in response to what the kettlebell was doing. And that's a really good tip to keep in mind for kettlebell swings globally. The kettlebell swing is not about making the kettlebell do what you want it to do. Rather, it's about putting the kettlebell onto a path, onto a trajectory, and then you responding as the kettlebell moves. Susan, come on back, let's do five more of those. So again, you guys are watching how static she is through her hips and shoulders. Yeah, there's a little bit of movement, but it's not a ton. Kettlebell is going really high as it comes up behind her. Her forearm is hitting high in her, in her inner thighs, which is exactly where we want to be. Uh, do me a favor, face forward. Let's do a couple more of these. The last thing that I actually want to share, and I mentioned a minute this earlier, before you go down, before you even come down, how wide should our feet be? Well, a really good rule of thumb is you only want to be as wide as you need to be. And how wide do you need to be? Well, you have a ball of iron with a handle on it that is going to be passing through your legs. Your legs need to be wide enough that you don't hit yourself. And we're not really talking about like hitting the groin as much as we are talking about running an inner thigh. So if you've got big, strong thighs, or you have a big, wieldy kettlebell, or even a pair of kettlebells, you're going to have to go wider. If the kettlebell is smaller or your thighs are smaller, 
you can go narrower. You really want to find that sweet spot that is just wide enough for it to pass through, um, but not so wide that it's just like a ton of extra room. So actually Susan's width has something to do with the size of her legs, right? She's kind of compensating for that. Let's do five, just like these. So strong back, little bit of drop down as the kettlebell comes back because she's again counterbalancing against it. The weight is staying pretty even on her feet. I can see how little her shoes are moving. So that is our hike pull or the first pull for the swing. The next thing that we're going to work on is actually going into a full swing with what we call a dead stop swing. We'll be right back. We know how to do our setup for a kettlebell swing. We, need to do, we know how to do our hike pull. Let's now get into our first swings. And we're going to do these as we call dead stop swings. And dead stop simply means that every single rep, the kettlebell is going to come back to the ground, it's going to pause on the floor, which is nice because it gives us a chance to reset, clean things up, and then we go again. And then we'll move later on into our continuous swings where we can do sets of 5 or 10 or 150 all in a row. So I'll have Susan set up as usual. Okay. Uh, you can actually narrow your feet in just a little bit. You went a little wider than you have been, which again, we're going to start to see those shifts happening. So here's what Susan's going to do. She is going to, when I say go, she's going to pull the kettlebell into her inner thighs, back into the height position. She's going to then stand up really hard and fast in the plank position, bringing the kettlebell up to about eye height or shoulder height. And then the kettlebell's going to return back and slide back to the ground. And she's going to end exactly where she started, or so we hope. Let's just do one. Pause there. Let's do one more. Great. And relax for a second. So one of the things that I want you guys to know about kettlebell swings is this is an ongoing skill development. Yes, it's a basic skill in comparison to learning kettlebell snatches or uh, kettlebell cleans. However, it doesn't mean that it's a basic skill that it's easy to learn. A really good example of this if you know what a muscle-up is, what a ring muscle-up is, is where we take a pair of gymnastics rings and we do a pull-up, we transition and then we do a pair of dips so that we end up pushing ourselves above the rings. Well, there are people in gyms all over the country who spend years learning to do muscle-ups. Um, however, if you wanted to be a gymnast and you walk into like a gymnastics training facility and like you want to be a professional gymnast or an Olympic gymnast and they're like, so show us a muscle-up, you're like, oh, I've been working on it for a couple years and don't quite have it. They're going to say, well, come back once you own that movement, right? Muscle up is not an easy skill to acquire, but it is truly a basic skill that unlocks a whole other world of stuff. It's a prereq for being able to get into any sort of gymnastics training, at least at the, at the higher levels. So, with that in mind, don't worry about not getting your swings right. They take a lot of time to develop. So Susan, as I had said, made one of the most common errors, which is breaking at her hips too early. So what I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you do one more just like that, and then we're going to break this down. Great. So go ahead and stand on up. And what I want you to do, Susan, is bring your arms out in front and, and interlace your thumbs. And the beauty of this is if you catch your thumbs together, it kind of replicates holding onto the kettlebell handle. And then bring the rest of your fingers in, clasp them. And if you had a kettlebell, your arms would be straight, right? Your wrists would be straight out. Because that kettlebell would be pulling out this way. Now, here's where that error came in. As soon as the kettlebell was up here, it kind of gets weightless for just a second. That's how ballistic curves work. It gets to the top of its apogee. At that point, the kettlebell started pulling on your hands. And here's what happened. You went to here. Now, if we just pause for a second, I just want you guys to draw a vertical line from Susan's shoulder and then compare that line's position to the position at the center of her hip. You notice how long that line is? That line is what we call a moment arm. That line is how much force the kettlebell gets to put into her low back. Stand on up for me. I'm going to show you the other way of doing this. Give your elbows a tiny bit of a bend, and I want you to bring your hands down until they are in contact with the sides of your rib cage. Now, start to hinge. Look at that moment arm from her hands back to the hip. That line is so much shorter. This means that her low back is going to be in a much safer position. 
So here's going to be the adjustment for the next couple of reps. When you're at the top, wait for that kettlebell to come down and almost having your arm contact your rib cage or your chest or your breast, that is the moment that unlocks the hips for the hips to come backwards. And this is the point too where if you have shorter arms, a wider rib cage, a bigger chest, whether because of breasts and or muscles, you are going to need to put a bend in your elbows so that, that the arms come around. It does this no good anatomically to have those arms running into breast tissue, running into muscle, running into ribs. Bend the elbows a little bit and wait for the kettlebell to come low. So let's go again. Let's try two. There we go. One more. Good. So those two swings were much, much better for Susan. She did a really good job of waiting for the kettlebell to come down. One of the ways that we, one of the cues that we've used in the past here has been uh, playing chicken. Do you know what the game of chicken is? <laughs> so the number of people that I know under the age of like 40 who really who are like, yes, I know what chicken is. Chicken is when two drivers or pilots are, or two motorcycles are on like a collision course to each other on a single road or on a single vector, uh, and opposite vectors, I guess, but like they're gonna come head on, and the chicken is whoever swerves off first, whoever is like, oh, no, I'm out of here, and I don't wanna die. So what we're doing kind of is playing chicken with the kettlebell with our junk, right? I do not want you to hit your pelvis, I don't want you to hit your bits. Nothing good comes out of that. There's some terrible jokes that have come out of it, but nothing positive. But you are almost doing that. You're waiting until the very last moment before the hips break back. Otherwise, you're going to put the long moment arm and the sheer force on the back goes way up. So I'll have you do, let's just do two more, just like that. Notice how long she waits for it. Good. Yep. Great. So guys, those are our dead stop swings. I highly encourage you to stop this now, practice with a handful of those, maybe record them on your phone, take a look and see. Again, big thing is, are you doing a good job of waiting long enough for the kettlebell to come down before breaking your hips back? It is the most common error. I actually made Susan do a few of those before I even helped her correct it, because it is that common. But what I'll tell you is that once you've learned to fix it, that fix generally sticks for all of us. That's the end of the dead stops. Again, hit pause and practice. Next up, we're going to go to continuous swings where we start to get to put these to get things together for some longer sets. Let's take a look at continuous kettlebell swings. So we know our setup. We know to how to do our height pull or our first pull. We know how to snap open into our full swing with the dead stop swing. And now we're going to look at continuous swings where we do these things back to back to back. A couple of ground rules as you start in the continuous swing. swings. First rule, if you realize that a swing has gone bad, do not try to recover it. Rather, as quickly as possible and as safely as possible, move that kettlebell back to the ground. So what, I've, what tends to happen is if the timing gets a little bit off and we try to recover, we're actually more likely to make a mistake that's going to lead to an injury or a bigger error. Uh, it is always better to just stop the set, shake it out, take a couple breaths, and start over. The other piece here, as we get into continuous swings, is to remember that timing is truly everything. Uh, two words, maybe just one, I don't know, but a, a concept to consider is apogee. And if we think about a rocket launching, especially if you ever launched model rockets as a kid, you actually see the moment that the rocket is like max out its flight trajectory and it's going to start to come back down. The very top of that flight path is its apogee. And by definition, at an apogee, the apogee is the moment where the upward force due to the momentum that you've put into the kettlebell and the force of gravity pulling it back down are balanced, right? So it is weightless at that moment. And how many times during a kettlebell swing is your kettlebell weightless? Twice. It happens once when it's at the top, and it happens once when it's in the back swing. The thing to remember about the apogee is to enjoy that moment of pause, and that is where you are waiting for the kettlebell to dictate its own timing. 
And the timing will always be consistent on Earth because gravity is still pulling at 9.8 meters per second squared. But you need to feel the kettlebell out. You need to kind of give it a chance to tell you when it's ready to move. Yes, we can pull the kettlebell down violently um, and make it more power swing. But as a basic skill, it's actually a lot better to learn to be patient and let the kettlebell dictate its own pace. And what you'll find is that it wants to go perfectly fast, but you can take a little break at the top, especially at the top, if you figure out the timing. Anyway, with that said, let's get into continuous swing. Susan's going to set up just as she has been. She'll measure her foot, do the two foot thing, blah, 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 blah. Feet a little hug iron hip width, just enough room to clear the kettlebell through the inner thighs. I'm going to have Susan just do a set of five here. And then we're going to talk about a couple of details and see how she can clean these up. Let's go. Cool. So here are the things that we should be looking for as we watch someone do swings. First and foremost, do they keep their chest slightly upright? Or is there ever a moment that it looks like they are just staring at the ground or they're just pointing their breastbone at the floor? At minimum, the breastbone should be pointing out. You know, her eyes, her breastbone too, could both always be pointing at the kettlebell out in front. She might even keep her eyes out further. What we don't want to do is sink to the point that we are like face it, fully facing the ground. That's going to tend to unlock the spine and have us rounding slightly forward. Another error that shows up sometimes is over swinging. We want to have a kettlebell swing that is ending somewhere around shoulder height, eye height. For our purposes, we're doing what we're going to call, or other people have called Russian-style kettlebell swings. This is to designate it versus the American swing. The American swing typically goes overhead. It is not something that I recommend, frankly, for anyone. If you want to go overhead, work on presses, work on kettlebell snatches with a single hand. Uh, you know, CrossFit kind of popularized the American swing, and because of that, we needed to have the name Russian-style swing. All we mean, though, is the kettlebell should pass the line of the belly button, and it does not go above the line of the eyes. Anywhere in here is totally fine. If Susan's doing this with a 25-pound kettlebell, if I were to give her 100, 100 pounds, I expect it to cross her navel, but not, maybe not come a whole lot higher, at least not to start with. So those are the two things that we're going to keep an eye on for her next set of five. Eyes, so chest is staying up, and secondly, high, maximum height of the swing above the navel, but below the eyes. Let's go for five. where there tends to be a lot of 
uh, vigorous and energetic breathing. <laughs> that movement, that, that breathing pattern is not just to intimidate our enemies, although maybe it works, but more importantly, what we're doing is we're training ourselves and we're using breathing as a way of getting the brain to engage the abdomen the way that we want it to. If you're going to take a punch or throw a punch, taking a breath in, holding about 80% of that breath, and letting out just about 20% of the, of the exhale powerfully through purse lips, there's a really good way of bracing your abs against the punch you're about to receive, or to actually brace your abs so that your hips can rotate and add power into that swinging punch. Because if your abs are soft, doesn't matter how fast and how hard your hips are swinging, it's not going to translate to the upper body because they're disconnected. So that breathing isn't the everything for the swing, but it is a really nice add-on and it's something that is totally worth practicing. It often makes counting harder, but so be it, right? These things will come with skill. Um, we're going to have Susan do a set of 10 this time. We'll just do one more error analysis. So your job, guys, is to look at this like a coach. Think about all the things that we've talked about today with kettlebell swings and ask yourself, hey, where could she clean this up? Or what are the things that she's doing really well that I want to learn from? Let's go for a set of time.